Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Can, see, can you see Javier? Is he outside the door there or nearby? No? Hmm? What's that? So no, nobody ring the gong. Yeah. Do you want me to ring the gong? Yeah. Yeah. If you ring the gong, maybe he'll come back. Yeah. So. so I do hope everyone is doing well. And uh, so, anyone have any questions to start off some discussion? Yes. Um, I heard you mention about doing the talking regarding to uh, the possible ability also use the light mm-hmm. to uh, help him go into deeper journal. Yes. And uh, would you explain how to use this mental object as a meditation object and, and, and helping us to go in deeper to the journal? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, First, just to clarify that you can enter the jhanas at different levels of concentration. And in the lighter levels of concentration, uh, the jhanas are, are not so deep and you can use as the object of your concentration something that is still dependent upon the physical senses, like the sensation of the breath, which are, we're using as a meditation object. But in the deepest jhanas, uh, to enter the jhana, the mind is, has to be completely withdrawn from all physical sensation. And so that means that the object that you're using to concentrate on needs to be something that is purely a mental object. And um, in, in the Vasudhi Magga, it's, uh, it's called a nimitta. The, uh, the nimitta, the mental object that you use for entering these deep jhanas, uh, if you, the, the best one to use is one that uh, arises directly from the meditation object. And so, uh, and it's called a mental counterpart in that case. Uh, so if you're using the sensation of the breath, as a meditation object, then at some point there will arise an awareness of actually what the the impression is that is made on the mind by those sensations when they occur. So it'll be like a mental representation of the sensations, and it is a mental object. Uh, And uh, you can enter jhanas, uh, very deep jhanas, very quickly using that. But as it turns out, you can use almost any mental object to enter jhana, enter those deep jhanas. So another one that has, uh, in uh, uh, comparatively recent times, become popular is the light. Uh, Many people, probably most people, when they uh, reach a state of deep concentration, become aware of uh, an inner light that appears. Uh, sometimes it will appear as points of light, sometimes it will appear as a small sphere of light that may expand and contract and become brighter or less bright. And uh, if, you, if your concentration is strong and that light appears, <coughs> then you can cultivate that, that light, that illumination, as a, as a new meditation object, as a meditation object to move to as an alternative to the breath. Um, when, when that occurs, the, the proper way to do it is when you become aware of the light, the presence of a light. Uh, at first, if you try to take your attention to it too soon, it will just, you know, just disappear, it will go away. Because it is arising because of the uh, concentrated state that you have generated and uh, shifting the attention will tend to disrupt that. 
So what you do is, if you become aware of it, you just continue to meditate on your breath as before until that light becomes stronger and more stable. And then at some point you'll find that if you do shift your attention to it and take that as your object, instead of it disappearing, it will actually become stronger. And so then you can meditate on that until it becomes very strong. And then you can use it as a vehicle to enter jhana. The jhana means a, a absorption. It's probably the, the clearest translation. I mean, jhana actually, in a sense, means meditation. But in ter- it, it refers to a state of meditation where uh, the mind is described as being completely absorbed in the meditation object. And this is how... This is one way that you can experience it. You're, you're meditating on this, this object, whether it's the breath nimitta or, or whether it's the light. You're meditating on this object, and it's as though you become so completely absorbed in it that there, there is just, it completely fills your mind. There's, there's just no awareness of anything else. Um, and another way that you can describe it and that uh, more the way it feels that it happens to some people is that you place your attention on the object and it's as though the object just spontaneously expands and completely fills your mind. You know, so sometimes it's as though you're sinking into it and sometimes as if it's just expanding within your mind. But uh, it's, uh, it's an absorption because um, Basically, the capacity, the, the capacity of your conscious awareness is completely devoted to this one object. And when you enter the jhana, now at this stage of concentration, there will already be a, uh, a strong feeling of, of pleasantness in the body and happiness and, and a, a, a kind of joyful excitement. The mental state that you will be in due to the concentration is a joyful excitement. And uh, you will experience both a, a, a mental pleasantness and a physical pleasant, pleasantness in association with that. If it's a if it's a light jhana you're going into, then you'll have very much a lot of you know you feel as though there's pleasant vibrations in your body. If you're going into a deep jhana, then it's a pleasantness that is detached from ordinary sensation. You have you have an awareness of of having a body, but it's but there is no physical sensation. There's no longer any physical sensation. That body may seem light. They, that body may seem to be actually made of light. That body may seem to be in a completely different position than it is. You know, I I sometimes uh, uh, quite often uh, the the impression in my mind of my body is that I'm standing up, even though I'm sitting down. So, this, so the body that you sense is not the physical body, and the pleasure that you feel in it is not, it, it's definitely pleasantness uh, related to the body, but it's not, it's not the normal kind of pleasantness associated with skin sensations and warmth and softness and comfort and things like that. <clears throat> it's a completely mental thing. In these deep jhanas, it's, you are completely within the space of your own mind, and you've, you've withdrawn yourself from the physical world, and from the physical body, and from the physical senses. And it's a very deep state of concentration, uh, accompanied by joy and happiness and, and, and single-pointedness, and the attention to the meditation object directed and sustained attention. That's what we're cultivating here, this directed and sustained attention. And in that first jhana, you still have directed and sustained attention together with the joy and the happiness. But to enter jhanas of different degrees of depth, um, as I say, a lighter jhana, you can enter still awareness of the body, still hearing you know, certain sounds, uh, still even in the first jhana having occasional uh, uh, experience of uh, 
not, not a verbal thought, but of an intention arising. You have an intention to stay in the jhana, an intention to leave the jhana, an intention to try to move to the next jhana, and so forth. And these are, are sort of subtle thought processes that you can have. Uh, uh, a, a sort of subtle thought process associated with the awareness of the different uh, uh, jhana factors of, of, of joy and pleasantness and directed and sustained attention and the meditation object and so forth. In the deeper jhanas, it's, it becomes so, you're so fully absorbed that uh, there is only a vague awareness of the passage of time and there's essentially no thought taking place. It's, uh, it's just a suspension, a suspension of uh, normal thought processes. It's uh, from the first jhana you can move to the higher jhanas, and um, in the way that I was taught, you discard the nimitta after the first jhana. You you have your me- your meditation object becomes the mental mental state of joy and the feelings of happiness. Uh, and so as you move through the jhanas. In the second jhana, you take the, the joyful mental state as your primary meditation object. And then discarding that, you take the feeling uh, of, of happiness or mental pleasure uh, and the uh, residual sense associated with that of, of physical pleasure of, not of, of this mental body that you perceive. And then discarding all pleasure, sensation of pleasure, then in the fourth jhana, it's just a pure state of conscious awareness. It's like uh, there's just that clear luminosity of, of the mind itself, and that is your that's the primary object of your awareness in this jhana. The jhanas serve some very valuable purposes. They uh, the practice of jhana profoundly deepens the quality of your concentration when you're not in jhana. It also causes the feelings of joy and happiness and tranquility, especially tranquility, uh, and in the higher jhanas of equanimity, to be very persistent. So that if you uh, practice meditation and you sit in jhana for a certain period of time, and then you get up from the jhana and you go back to other activities, the concentration you have, uh, even though you're, you're out there doing things, you have uh, a, a very still, very focused mind, very high level of mindful awareness. The state of mind is a, a tranquil joyfulness. So there's both the tranquility and the joy are present, and there's very strong equanimity. This is uh, the absolute perfect state of mind to practice uh, the ap- four applications of mindfulness uh, as a vipassana practice in your life or to do any other sort of practice. But this lasts, the, the joy and the tranquility and equanimity and, the, and this concentration will last for uh, many hours. If you, the more jhana practice you do, the longer it lasts. So, you know, if you uh, say you're meditating for two or three hours a day, by the time you sit down and meditate the next day, you still, you haven't lost that. You sit down and you immediately go into a deep state of concentration and you can enter the jhana again right away. So this is one of the advantages of practicing jhana, is that all of these enlightenment factors of concentration, mindful awareness, joy, tranquility, and equanimity are all present and persist, present uninterruptedly. Uh, The other benefit of jhana practice is that you can do a very powerful kind of vipassana on the entering and leaving of the jhanas, being aware of what is present before you enter the first jhana, uh, and then what what is present and what is absent in the jhana, and then when you emerge from the jhana, what is present and what is absent. Likewise, in the second jhana, being aware of what is present and what is absent before, during, and after, and observing the 
a, a merging of what has not been present and the passing away of what is present in the entering and leaving of the jhanas. So this is a very, very powerful basis for vipassana. It's, uh, in a sense, the counterpart to the vipassana practice that is based on the observation of uh, the rising and passing away of sense objects and, and thoughts. Because when you do that vipassana practice, you're watching, you're observing the rising and passing away of these ordinary kinds of objects, of sensations and, and thought and mental objects. In the jhana, you're observing the rising and passing away of those very things that make up the mind and the mental experience itself. On entering the first jhana, there is a passing away of sensation in its totality. You're left with the what, what is left in addition to uh, the mental state and the the vedana, the feeling. Uh, there is also the uh, activity, the, the the sustained and directed activity of the mind. So this is a very important part of what makes up the mind. You can see sensation pass away and the, the uh, directed and sustained movement of the mind being, being still present and mental state still being present and vedna or feeling still being present. And then when you uh, emerge from the first jhana, you become aware of the of the reactivation of all of the senses. It's like, and when you come out of the jhana, it's like uh, you suddenly pop back into the world of the senses and for a little bit the senses are, can be quite intense. So it's, good, it's a very good opportunity to observe the nature of sensation and also the nature of the mind's reaction to sensation. The mind Sensation is just sensation, but of course the mind interprets sensation and puts identity on it. The activity of the mind, when you come out of jhana, the first sensations that come up, the mind immediately starts attaching the labels and concepts to it. And and you can actually see the mind reconstructing the world uh, out of the sensations as they return. (coughs) Then you go into the second jhana, where you've not only... Uh, you, you've not only set aside sensation, but you've withdrawn the mind from its normal kind of activity. Uh, uh, and so there is just the mental state and the feeling present. And, and uh, I, won't, I won't continue to describe it in detail, but as you go through these jhanas, and you, from the fourth jhana, you can go into the first, uh, what, what's called the first of the formless jhanas. It's really, uh, it's still the fourth jhana, but it's where you set aside the last vestige of form, which is the sense of space and the sense of your body uh, being, uh, well, for that matter, the sense of your mind being located in a particular space, uh, location in space. And so it's called the, the, the base of infinite space. So what this is like, it's like a scientist dissecting uh, an animal to see the organs that make it up, or dissecting a plant to see the different tissues that make up the plant. It's like, the, uh, it's exactly that same, same thing, except it is your own mind that you're dissecting. You're dissecting the, the components of conscious experience away one layer at a time, one layer at a time to see what lies beneath that and experience that in isolation. And it leads to profound understanding. Um, you realize entering the, uh, uh, the, the form of the, uh, or the, the uh, base of infinite space from the fourth jhana, how space itself is an aspect of form that uh, really is a part of the mind. And you expand that to infinity and then you no longer have that distinct sense of, of, of being located in a particular place in space. 
So your original question was about using the light as uh, as an imita for entering jhana. And I uh, got carried away as I can to and told you all about how you can use jhanas. <laughs> I'll say a little bit more about that. In the sutras, uh, the way the jhanas are described, it becomes obvious that there are uh, that the Buddha didn't make a clear distinction between what we call the light jhanas that in, didn't involve such deep concentration and the deep jhanas that did involve considerable concentration because there are very clear references to both. I mean, if you look at... And the jhanas, the, throughout the sutras, the jhanas are discussed over and over again as the path to enlightenment. Uh, they are the definition of right concentration in the Eightfold Path. And there are references that seem to imply very strongly that uh, uh, the only way to achieve Buddhahood is uh, through the practice of the jhanas. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the deepest jhanas. And uh, what has been confusing nowadays is that uh, the uh, uh, what's called the path of purification, uh, which is the principal commentary in the Theravada on the uh, sutras, uh, makes in its description makes the assertion that. The only real jhana is the deepest jhana that involves the withdrawal of the mind from the senses. And when we go back to the sutras, we realize that that, that although the Buddha did make a couple of references, that there are sutras where he's clearly, unmistakably referring to those very deep jhanas with withdrawal that involve withdrawal of the mind from the senses, that in many other cases he's referring to jhanas that are not anywhere near that deep. So the Visuddhi Magga has misled some people to say that the only real jhanas are the deepest jhanas. And the Visuddhi Magga also says that perhaps only one in ten thousand monks can achieve the deepest jhanas. <laughs> so that tends to be a discouraging perspective, uh, uh, perspective on things. So, But uh, uh, you can all achieve the lighter jhanas. And... Uh, I think that the lighter jhanas are all that you will you'll really need at least to uh, accomplish the first few uh, uh, path attainments of the four stages of enlightenment. Also, the experience that a person has that's called path and then the subsequent experience they have called fruition uh, and the fruition experience is one that needs to be repeated over and over again. These are all jhanic experiences. They are complete absorption into that which uh, uh, consciousness is uh, engaged with, which is nirvana. And so it's the nature of jhana that each time, any time you enter jhana, or each time you enter jhana, it greatly deepens the power of your concentration and makes it easier to enter deep states of concentration in the future. So that uh, with, uh, with the experience of path and fruition, the yogi thereafter will find it easier to enter jhana or easier to enter deeper jhanas than they otherwise would have. So. Uh, even if someone's never experienced, even if their first jhanic experience is uh, the uh, path attainment of stream winner, they will find it easier to achieve jhana thereafter. More than you ask for. Huh? <laughs> Stop me or I'll get carried away again. <laughs> yes? Um. Here's just a quick one. Say, so if the first, if the, if the yogi's first attainment is the path attainment of stream winner, mm-hmm. then it will be easier for them to get into jhana, right? Yes. Now, the first path attainment being of stream winner, is that referring to, the, to those fetters? I'm just trying to, to remember what, 
what stream winner means. That means that you let go of the idea of rites and rituals, or what is yes, that? the stream, the fetters that the, of the ten fetters, the three that are overcome uh, when a person becomes a stream winner are the uh, uh, belief and attachment to the sense of self and the belief in the efficacy of rites and rituals and uh, the overcoming of doubt about the, uh, about the Dharma. Okay. Let's see if someone else has one. The, what's that? I was going to see if someone else had a question. But I yeah, someone else does. So. Okay. Yeah. I had a question. Um, I is uh, a stream winner still have a uh, uh, ill will, like five hindrances and du- during the life and during the meditation? Uh, in order to have the stream entry experience, there had to have been there, uh, a complete suppression of the five hindrances through concentration. And then they will remain uh, suppressed for quite a long time after that. But the stream entrant has not abolished craving, and so they will experience desire and ill will. Okay, and so those, those hindrances uh, will, will still arise, but in a much weakened form. And uh, the longer it's been uh, just, just to clarify, it's, uh, it's important in the practice that when you've had the path attainment experience, you've had this uh, experience of nirvana that has made you become a stream winner, it's that you're able to repeat this experience, only at this time it's no longer, it's not called a path attainment, now it's called a fruition experience. You're experiencing the fruit of that first attainment. And it's important that that be done and that be repeated over and over again. If uh, if this happens when a yogi is in retreat and then they go back into the world, then this is it, this is going to gradually decay and deteriorate. And as they go into circumstances where uh, there uh, there's a lot of chaos, distraction, pressure, uh, things that trigger habitual thought patterns and behavior patterns, the person is going to, this, this is where uh, as the, hind- the hindrance starts, starts to reemerge, and the person can start to re-experience desire and aversion, suffering, uh, and even uh, uh, engage in some unwholesome uh, activities. One of the myths that they say about stream winners is that their their sila, their morality, is perfect. It's not, because they still have craving, they still have desire and aversion, they still have all of their old habits of behavior, so they can slip into some unwholesome activities. But because they are a stream winner, and because they have completely overcome the belief and attachment in the personal self, which feeds this, craving, desire, and aversion are more easily recognized and more easily overcome. So what will happen, a stream winner may experience suffering, but before it becomes very severe, they, they sort of snap out of the, the, the dream, the, the sleep that they're in, and they realize the, the, the foolishness of this. And, uh, and so the only suffering they experience is very attenuated. Likewise, they may engage in some unwholesome behaviors, but it doesn't take very long before they snap out of it and realize you know, that this habitual pattern of behavior, that the, its causes can be seen through and understood, and the behaviors can be eliminated, and then they can do whatever is necessary to make amends for those behaviors. Personally, I think this is a very good way to understand the meaning uh, when they say that a stream winner is a seven times returner. It's often interpreted to mean that the stream winner can die and be reborn as many as seven times before they achieve 
their complete enlightenment. But another way of looking at it, they became a stream winner, and that's that's called an awakening. It's compared to awakening from a bad dream. But you know how it is. You can be having a bad dream, and you can wake up, and you can be relieved, and oh, it's just a dream and everything. But you can fall back to sleep, and you can the dream can start up again, right? It can, right? And but usually, if that happens, you wake up again pretty soon, mm-hmm. and that might happen a number of times. But you know, you wake up more easily, and then you pull yourself back out of that dream again more quickly each time. And I think that's a very good way of understanding what the seven times returner. Let's uh, let's stay within one lifetime. Within one lifetime, the stream winner has this experience, but he still has a certain vulnerability. So she can still slip into those patterns of thought and behavior that uh, are experienced as suffering and, and lead to suffering. But it's like falling back into the dream and then waking up again. Falling back into the dream and waking up again. The, the second path attainment is called the once returner. And the person who has achieved the second path, it's really clear to them that there is only one wholesome mental state. And they're very aware of this. And the only wholesome mental state that they ever experience is when, for any period of time, there actually is no craving. There is no desire and aversion. And any mental state where desire and aversion are still present is unwholesome. So what they have to do, the job of the, the task of the once returner is to do the final uprooting of desire and aversion. And so what that is like, if we compare, if we stay with the same analogy, that's like being a lucid dreamer. You go back into the dream, but you know you're dreaming, and you never forget for an instant that you're dreaming. You're completely aware that you're dreaming. And a lucid dreamer has some control over what happens in the dream. So a a lucid dreamer... Uh, it, things are not going to happen completely out of the control of the lucid dreamer the way they do uh, with an ordinary dreamer. And so it is the task, just, just as the lucid dreamer can actually do a kind of, of work and exert a kind of control within the dream, it's the task of the once returner, the person who's had this path attainment, goes back <coughs> into life back into the dream that samsara is, but without losing the awareness. And now their task is to do the work of the final uprooting of uh, desire and aversion where, wherever they arise. And so the non-returner doesn't have to go into the dream anymore, <laughs> right? The non-returner has uprooted desire and aversion and all craving related to the sensual world. So, so the non-returner uh, doesn't have to go into the dream anymore. That's the non-returning to the dream of samsara. So that's another way of understanding these terms, these labels. So my following question is, uh, is there any way that, that uh, if, uh, if a person who knows uh, he, he or she is in which stage and or he or she need a teacher or qualified uh, <coughs> the, uh, consent to verify this person's stage? Um, a person can know themselves after, uh, after a period of time. The best way to know is to have a teacher that is familiar with the, uh, with the yogi's progress. Because the teacher will recognize the uh, development of the insights and will recognize the stages that approach uh, path attainment, stream entry. And then 
the yogi will have an experience which uh, the the teacher can tell is most probably stream, and and and, it, and it's probably most probably the path attainment, nirvana, the stream entry. Now the thing is that it it you can't tell absolutely for certain until you see that the changes have occurred in that person subsequently and that those changes persist. Uh, there are other kinds of profound, blissful, exciting, insightful experiences that a person can have. But that, uh, and, and because of the person's uh, blissfulness as a result of those experiences being filled with love and kindness, they may appear to be a stream winner for a while. But the question is, has, has, has there truly been a destruction of these three fetters? Right. And that can only be judged with absolute certainty by seeing the changes that take place and if those changes persist and actually become strong, more strongly manifest, you know, and which is what happens. That they, you know, the, this initial... There's the initial bloom that gradually fades over a few days or weeks or months. And then from that point, either, either there is the continued development and, and solidification and uh, uh, advancement towards the next path, or if it wasn't a genuine experience at that point, then the further away the person gets from it in time, the more they will tend to revert to the, the previous state. So that's why to absolute to say with absolute total certainty you have to, there's a certain element of you have to wait and see. But if uh, if the yogi has a teacher who has these has had these experiences and understands them, then the then that teacher can not only guide them but can recognize in fact that that yes the uh, the the medicine is taking effect. And the cure is spreading to deeper and deeper levels, and the yogi is on the path now to to the next level. So that's that's what's important. Um, it's uh, it's an interesting thing that a person who has achieved stream entry will almost certainly know it, but not always. There's actually some people's understanding becomes so clear that when you know the, the final breakthrough occurs, it's almost, oh yeah, right? So it's not such a big deal. But mostly it's so profound that the yogi knows that something has really happened. The problem is that many yogis can think that they've had that experience, but they haven't, you know. <laughs> Imagination? So, um, a wishful thinking, imagination, or there are some very profound mystical person, mystical experiences a person can have that come close but don't quite, <coughs> quite reach. I see. Yeah. So, so basically, um, this person's behavior, long-term behavior, probably can indicate. That's exactly right. The long-term behavior. And the person will have obviously have much less attachment to uh, the personality view of self. And the person will manifest much less enslavement to desire and aversion. And the person will have something, a kind of compassion born in them of a deep understanding of the oneness of us all that uh, will only become more evident, will affect all of their relationships with others. So these, these are the signs that uh, can be recognized. Will this person become more sensitive uh, towards this person's surrounding and the people that sometimes he or she just knows somebody needs something 
and they just go ahead and give a help. Uh, that sort of insensitivity towards. Uh, that certainly can happen, but that doesn't nece- that doesn't necessarily have to happen. A lot depends on the individual, all of their prior conditioning, and the circumstances they're in, and, and what they do. So. Uh, a person would be predisposed to be more sensitive to to others, and they will have a higher degree of mindful awareness. But it won't necessarily become obviously uh, obvious in the way you describe in every case. So the fact that that didn't happen wouldn't wouldn't be a sign that uh, the person was in fact not a stream winner, so, because it doesn't necessarily have to happen. But if you do, see, if if you did see that in a person, then uh, that would suggest that they might be a streamliner. But uh, uh, for sure, that uh, this person is going to be more kind, uh, more compassionate. Uh, they are going to be before. more compassionate in terms of their reaction to the suffering of others. I see, and more kind towards other people. Right? And more kind. As a result of that, yes. yeah, doesn't mean if they were a person who tended to be aloof and withdrawn from others before that they would cease to be aloof and withdrawn. That doesn't. But when the contact comes, if there's if the suffering there, there will naturally be more compassion. You had another question? I did. Um, the jhanas sound really interesting. And just got a book on jhanas because I'm so interested in it, but don't want to open it up because I haven't gotten through your ten stages yet. And I haven't finished uh, writing it all yet either. I <laughs> have to wait a long time. <laughs> yeah. So, so, and I, I remember you know, in your book it says these are foundational um, stages. So it, w- would your instruction be Get, a, get the hang of the first ten stages before we bring a book on jhanas. Well, which book on jhanas did you get? I, I can't remember what the title of it is, but it's something like Two Spiritual Friends or something. I'm not sure if it's... Uh, yes, that's uh, the Pahak uh, uh, Method. Uh, I know the book. I haven't read it. I'm looking forward to reading it myself. Yeah, it's good. It should, I, I, <laughs> the teacher, their teacher, is, uh, is a, a, a very powerful teacher. And so I'm expecting uh, that that book will be very good. I ordered that book, so maybe when I go home, I'll, it'll be there and I can read it. <laughs> the jhanas, uh, Pa'a teaches the deep jhanas, and he stresses really profound concentration yeah, and really deep jhanas. So just to put that in perspective so that you'll, you'll know what you're looking at. Um, but uh, and when I started writing the book that I haven't finished and when I first started teaching I was coming from the background of my own training which was deep jhanas and um, in, in the training I received from my teacher I didn't know that the light jhanas existed and I didn't really understand them or how to use them until uh, I met Lee Brasington, who's a student of Ayakima. And so if you're interested in the jhanas, just to give you that other perspective, you might like to uh, read uh, uh, some of Ayakima's writings. And uh, I don't think Lee Brasington has written a book, but he does have a website with some interesting things on there, including uh, a description of his own experience. Uh, he went and did a retreat with Pa Hock. And so you might like to read that. That's, that's another thing that you could pursue. So my background when I started out was I didn't realize, uh, I, I didn't know about the light jhanas, only the, only the deep jhanas, which are very, very powerful. But uh, a lot of people can't, can't access them, at least until after they've already become stream enterers, at least. So it was, uh, I, I think, very wonderful to discover the light jhanas and, uh, uh, 
and to practice them and realize that they are indeed genuine jhanas and they are very powerful tools. They are very accessible to virtually everyone. And um, in a sense I see them as sort of a missing piece to the method that I was trained in. Because you get to a certain point in that method and without knowing about the light jhanas, it's very, very difficult to, uh, uh, for many people, uh, difficult in the sense of taking a long time, especially in lay practice, to arrive at the, at the tenth uh, stage, which is the, the perfect stage of samatha, which is the entry to the deep jhanas. And a lot of people, you know, I, I started teaching meditation and uh, I was confident that I could help people to reach the tenth stage in six months to a year or two years. And then I had some very diligent students who were practicing three or four years and were getting discouraged because, you know, they're at the eighth stage, but like, tenth stage still seemed like a long, long ways away. And now I've discovered that when people get to the seventh stage or the eighth stage, I can teach them these life genres. And then it's like, you know, supercharging them. It's like putting some nitro in their gas tank or something. Their concentration really deepens. And now I can see that the light jhanas are a path to the deep jhanas. The light jhanas enhance a person's concentration much more quickly and provides a valuable way of achieving those, eventually achieving those deep jhanas and achieving them more quickly. So... Go ahead and read about the jhanas and paaks, jhanas, but and also the light jhanas. That also, uh, you know, read some of Ayakima and uh, Lee Brasington, and uh, um, and I will instruct you in the light jhanas when uh, when I feel like that's the right thing for you to practice. Thank you. So it's a great new tool. It's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> How many people you already teach them use this light jhana? To, to, I've been, um, I don't have a count on it, but I've been doing it since last summer. Oh. And quite a few people, you know, uh, are finding great success with it. Uh, in the, uh, they get a lot of satisfaction with the light jhanas and uh, can start doing a more effective vipassana practice. Everybody's a little bit different in their capacities. And so you reach a certain point and the question comes, is it better to start doing more vipassana practice or is it better to continue deepening uh, uh, concentration first or is it appropriate to do a combination of both? You know, And so, uh, as I say, everybody's a little different. So the... the uh, and, and this is also something that you, uh, a, a teacher can help you with, but you can also explore and, uh, and experiment with on your own. It's always good to be, it's always good to practice with vipassana in mind. I see. But, but uh, when you talk about this light, I'm just uh, wondering if this light appear, but the, uh, the concentration still not as strong, but this light already appeared. So is this person needed to drop everything, go with this light, or still keep a okay. reaction? Let me make a clarification. Mm -hmm. Light has two meanings. Light as in light, and light as in Wait. not heavy yeah, or not, not deep. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Or, I'm talking about the light. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. The light as in nimitta. Yes. To use, it should, it should be used if you feel like you're ready for the deep jhanas. So if you've decided, if you've made the resolve that you're going to strive to be able to enter the deep jhanas, then when concentration produces the light, then you can shift to that. But if you do what I'm calling the light jhanas, as in not so deep concentration, light concentration jhanas uh -huh. rather than light jhanas, uh -huh. um, you, uh, you don't need to wait for the light to appear. And then when you do those jhanas, you may have the light appear. And unless it seems appropriate, I would say, disregard the light. It'll always be there. If you want to use it later, it'll always be there. 
but just ignore it and keep keep practicing okay. the the not so deep concentration John is using uh, the the uh, Basically, what you use to enter those jhanas is pleasant sensation. You use the piti and sukha themselves to, uh, uh, to go into the jhana. Thank you. Welcome, Joyce. It's very good to see you. And, uh, yeah. So, yeah. and, uh, With regard to the reasons that you had to be late, so I, uh, you have my great sympathy, and uh, your mother has my best wishes. Thank you. And your devotion is admirable. So. So uh, yes. Any other thoughts on Jonah's practice? Uh, 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 the the f- first jhana, f- uh, a person started to practice uh, meditation. So, in average, <laughs> from your experience, from the beginning to the f- first jhana, mm-hmm. average take how long practice? <coughs> um, I I keep. Revising that estimate. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is a silly question. I'm just curious. <coughs> it's so hard to say who is average. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and first of all, it's uh, let's just stick with the uh, uh, light jhanas. Mm-hmm. So. What is the average person? I mean, they're the people that uh, come to meditation classes from time to time and they meditate every now and then and it may take them many lifetimes. <laughs> and there's the ones who meditate every day diligently, uh, you know, uh, and for as much as they, opportunity as they can and go to, uh, go to retreats and things like that. So. Who is the average person? For the average person that establishes a regular daily practice uh, and keeps it up and uh, does longer meditation whenever they can, um, I would say they could probably do the, uh, on average from first beginning, probably uh, the light jhanas, maybe in a year. Mm -hmm. Maybe. and some people, much less than that. Some people within a few months. Mm-hmm. And some people, of course, it would take longer. So, I mean, this is just a out of out of the air kind of guess. It's that kind of reachable, though. It's something that I mean, anybody can reach in, in a very reasonable period of time. If you were to compare it to learning to play the piano... Ah, uh, I see. Okay. And, and because it's similar, you want to learn to play the piano, it depends on how much time you practice, you know. Um, so daily practice is important, mm-hmm. right? Continuity is important. Daily practice is very important. And when I say daily practice, I mean all day daily practice. It's what you do all day. It's not just sitting and meditating. It's, it's practicing the same mindfulness uh, in every other way that you can during the day. Uh, it's making the changes necessary in your life to minimize the uh, agitation of the mind so that your practice is more effective. Uh, making the changes necessary in your life so that you get an adequate amount of rest so that you're not trying to meditate when you're too tired. Um, so uh, a daily practice, yeah. <laughs> if a daily practice means more than just, well, I sit down and I meditate for 45 minutes or an hour 
and then it's like move to a totally different, you know, <laughs> completely leave that behind, you know, something totally different the rest of the time. It's very important that the meditation becomes one kind of practice and then your daily life becomes another kind of practice and they complement each other. Uh, in that case, I have a question I always forgot to ask you. Uh, listen to the Dharma talk. Do you consider that's one kind of uh, yes. uh, practice? Absolutely, yeah. Good. And you know how when you sit and practice concentration and when it starts to become easy and you start to look forward to meditation, you know you've really made some progress. Well, when you find you have some free time and you'd rather read about the Dharma or listen to a Dharma talk than, you know, turn on the television or read a novel or something like that, then you know your practice is successful. That's bearing fruit. Very promising. Two minutes. If, if nobody has a question, can I ask one more very quick one? Well, let me see. You know, when you start asking all your questions, then uh, uh, Chris had one more question that he was going to ask. I don't okay, know. Sure. No, I'm, no, I'm going to go ahead. You're good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Didn't want you to get left behind. Okay. Uh, it's just related to this uh, question about uh, this uh, Dhamma talk and uh, the daily activity. That uh, you say that uh, uh, sitting meditation is as important as how we uh, live our regular life. Yeah. So I have a question: Is when I do housework, mm-hmm. uh, I kind of have a habit just to put the earphone to listen to the Dharma talk, mm-hmm. do do some uh, work. Mm-hmm. Do you recommend that uh, I pay attention to the to the work I'm doing, or I can just listen to the Dhamma talk. Which one you prefer me to do? Both. Both have both have uh, value. Both have benefit. Uh, don't spend all of your time doing housework listening to Dharma talks because you miss out on the opportunity to practice uh, mindful awareness and concentration uh, when doing housework. But at the same time. If you've got housework to do, you might not be able to listen to all the Dharma talks you want, so use some of that that way, too. I'll tell all of you, when you're driving by yourself, great time to practice mindful awareness. Uh, Be completely aware of what you're doing. Be completely present. Um, Thoughts come, notice the thought and let it go, and pay attention to what you're seeing, what you're hearing, what you're doing. Great time to meditate. I know here, especially in this Los Angeles area, everybody spends a lot of time driving, you know. Um, And as far as I'm concerned, that's another time that you could listen to Dharma talks, but it's also another time that you could spend practicing meditation in your daily life. So, all right. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed this discussion. I hope that you did, and uh, it's time for lunch. Um, There has been a request for some guided meditation, sort of like what I did the very first uh, day. And so I thought that I might do that uh, as uh, at the beginning of the first sit after lunch. I'll come in and sit with you. And we'll just start it off. I'll, I'll basically guide you in the same way to the uh, meditation on the sensations of the breath. Okay, but uh, at some point I'll just be quiet again and let you continue as usual. All right. Thank you.